Today we're beginning a brand new series called Convicted. Convicted. And I came up with this series watching a Netflix series. I'm not going to tell you what the name of it was. But it, but it had to do with uh, inmates on death row. On death row. And I, and I began to study some things about... Uh, 8,000 people have been sentenced to death row since 1977 when it was reinstituted. And I didn't know this, but people who are put on death row, they spend 23 hours out of 24 hours in solitary confinement. They get one hour a day to shower and go outside and do recreation. And as I was watching this series, there was this undertone of every person that they interviewed. And the people who were interviewed would say something like this. The reason why I'm doing this video and I'm being interviewed is because I want people to see that I'm a good person. I did a bad thing. I'm a good person that did a bad thing. And their heartbeat was, could I be restored? Could I be forgiven? Could I be understood? And obviously some inmates had no remorse, they were bragging, almost gloating about their crimes, and others were broken, telling their story for the very first time. And this word conviction came to me. Uh, there's a lot of believers today that live their lives in a jail cell called conviction. Conviction. And they believe and they say that the conviction that they feel and the guilt that they feel that they were put in that cell by the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is convicting them. That the Holy Spirit is the one making them feel bad so that they don't mess up. And as I was thinking about that and I was thinking about the video that I was watching and all these things, I thought to myself, who would want to have a relationship with someone who makes them feel bad every day? Who wants to have a relationship with someone that makes them feel bad about themselves every day? And then for some reason, we as Christians are okay with believing that there is this being called the Holy Spirit. He's part of the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And his job is to make me feel bad every time I mess up. And I want to talk with you about that today. All right? Is this, that's kind of like the, the idea behind the whole series. I'm going to say this to you right now. I am fully aware of about what, I'm, about what I'm about to step into. Okay? I am fully aware that I'm going to step into something today that probably will get me uh, taken off of many preaching engagements around the world today. Uh, Pastor Mike, that's okay for you to preach that in your church, but don't bring that to my church. And uh, I have to come and preach this to you today. I ha I've lived many years of my life in that cell of conviction, of condemnation, of feeling self-hatred, and thinking that God was doing it. So we got to talk about that today. Four years ago, uh, I began to study a topic called grace, the grace message, uh, fully, completely. And I had this conversation in prayer, and I felt God ask me, would you introduce people to me like you would your best friend? Because what we do with our best friend is we sell our best friend to our, to our other friends. We tell all the great attributes of that person so that they would like them and accept them too. And this is my endeavor today. We're gonna read some scriptures today. And as we read these scriptures, I want you to do something very difficult. I want you to forget what you've always been taught. And I want you to put on new lenses. New lenses. And I'm gonna tell you what these lenses are. These aren't lens crafters, okay? These aren't lens crafters glasses. The lenses that I want you to wear today are this. Ready? That God is a good God. Amen. All right? So when we read this, we're going to read this in a belief that God's a good God. Okay? When we read these scriptures today, we're going to read these in the lenses that 
God loves me. Okay? We're going to read these verses today with the lenses that God is for me, not against me. Okay? Can we try that today? Can we do this? I'm going to tell you, it's, it's a little bit of psychology. It's called confirmational bias. We just learned about it in staff, uh, staff training. Confirmational bias is pretty much this, like, whatever you look for, you'll find. And most of us read our Bibles out of a sense that God's angry at us or that God's upset at me or I've done something wrong, and then we go read our Bible. That's not, that's not the confirmational bias that I want to use today. I want us to look at the Scripture as God loves me. God is a good God, that God is for me and not against me, okay? Can we try that today? Okay, so let's take a look at this first verse. It's in the book of John, John 16 and verse 7. This is Jesus speaking. This is before he has died on the cross. He's talking to his disciples, and he says this, But in fact, it is better for you that I go away, because if I don't, The Holy Spirit can't come, okay? Now, he calls him the advocate, okay? So let me give you all the names for this word advocate. He's the advocate. He is the comforter. He is the encourager. He is the counselor. Let me say that again. He is the advocate, the comforter, encourager, and counselor. This is the Greek word paraclete, not parakeet. Paraclete, okay? Paraclete. It is the definition of who the Holy Spirit is. He is the advocate. He is the comforter. He is the encourager. He is the counselor. Do do we have this so far? So Jesus is saying, it is for your good that I go away so that I can send the comforter. I can send the counselor. I can send the encourager. I'm just telling you today that if you're not feeling encouraged, you're not hearing the advocates. You're not hearing the paracletes, okay? All right. We're going to break this down. He says, I have to send this one. I have to go away. Ready? If I go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will. He has a job to do. This is not who he is is, but this is a task that he has to carry out. Got this? I will send him and he will, ready, convict the world, who? Of sin. Notice that that did not say that he will convict everybody of sin. That did not say that he will convict Christians of sin. That did not say that he will convict the righteous of sin. That did not say that he will convict the saints of sin. He's saying that he will convict the world, the lost, those who are separated from God. He will convict them of sin, watch, and of God's righteousness and of coming judgment. So what's the world's sin? Well, it tells us the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. So, I got to throw this out. I know that Christians want everybody else to behave too. I know that Christians want to control the laws in our country so that they fit our religious belief systems. I get that. But the world, those who are far from God, are only guilty of one sin. And that is the rejection of Jesus Christ. That's the only sin they're guilty of. They're guilty of rejecting Jesus Christ. Right here it says it, that they have not believed in me. And that's what he's coming to convict. He's coming to convict those who need a savior. He's saying, listen, you can't do this on your own. You need a helper. You need a comforter. You need an advocate. You need a counselor. Come to me. Come to me. Right? This is, not, this is not the same when you felt bad when you stole a piece of bubble yum, bubble gum from your mom's pocketbook. Right? You felt bad about that, but that was not the Holy Spirit convicting you. All right. I, I'm, I'm about to step in it. I'm about to step into it, okay? All right. 
The conviction of the Holy Spirit was towards the world for their rejection of Jesus Christ. Watch, he goes on to say this. And of righteousness, because righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. He's saying to you, you need righteousness. You need right standing with God. It is available to you. And of judgment will come because the ruler of this world will be judged. There will be a day that this earth will be judged, the Bible says. It says that this earth will pass away and that he will create a new heaven and a new earth. And this is the judgment that he's talking about. None of this was towards those who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ooh, I know, I know, I know, I know what that does. But then why, why do I feel so bad? Yeah, why? Why do we want to blame that bad feeling on God, though? Why is it his fault that you feel bad, that you made a decision that violated your own moral compass? Okay, let's just, go, let's, just, let's just look at some things. Let's just look at some things, okay? Before you knew all this, when you were a kid, you did bad, and you felt that same feeling. Because you did something mommy and daddy told you not to say. And when the bow bow came out, you were feeling some sort of way, right? And somehow, in some way, in some reason, we get saved and we say that that feeling that we had before we even knew God is now God. Adam and Eve sinned. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they went and hid. And God says, why are you hiding? Why are you hiding? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They went into something called the age of consciousness, that they were ruled by their conscience. They were ruled by that inner voice that told them right and wrong. And listen, this is, this is what we don't understand. Yes, I have the Holy Spirit, and, and I love the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't get it jaded. I'm Holy Ghost to the bone. I'll throw down some Hala Mashanda in a second, okay? But you have a conscience, and you have a human spirit, and they both know the difference between right and wrong. You don't need the Holy Spirit to nag you to remind you you messed up. Okay, we're gonna, I'm stepping in. We're going to get to this. Come on, come on. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there today. Why do we want to believe that it is God making us feel bad? What is it in us already that we're unsettled, that we're like, I can't believe this boy just lost his dang mind up there saying that ain't the Holy Ghost. Like, I just want to know why do we want to be in this cell of condemnation and conviction and believe that God put us there? Why do we want to believe that? What, what kind of comfort does that bring? It doesn't. Because I'm telling you right now, a person who hurts me, I don't want to hang out with them. A person who makes me feel bad about myself, we're not chilling. Okay, we're going to read another verse, and we're going to look at this verse with, God is a good God. God loves me. God is for me, not against me. Ready? 2 Corinthians 7, 8. Paul is speaking to us. He's writing a letter to the church at Corinth, and this is, in fact, his second letter to them, and we can understand that he wasn't so nice in the letter, okay? He says, I don't feel bad anymore even though my first letter hurt your feelings. I did feel bad at first, but I don't now. I know that the letter hurt you for a while. So he said some pretty harsh stuff, huh? Watch. Now I am happy, not because I hurt your feelings. It's because God used those hurt feelings to turn to him. And none of you were harmed by us. Watch this. Now let's break this down. God is good. God loves me. We got we to gotta read this this way. For godly sorrow, godly conviction leads to repentance unto salvation. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. 
I'm going to give you a heads up. Next week, I'm going to go too far. All right? Next week, I'm going to go too far. You don't want to miss that. Okay? Even if you don't like at all what I'm saying today, come back next week. I will totally offend you. <laughs> I'm the most excited I've ever been about a message as I am next week with a revelation that I got from the Holy Spirit. Okay? But let's look at this. It says that godly conviction leads to repentance that leads to salvation. And for the first time in ever studying the Bible, I saw that there's an equation here. There's an equation. Anybody a math nut in here? You like math? Anybody like money? Counting it? Okay, there you go. So, so there's a mathematical equation here. Ready? I, I, I think I discovered, I broke something. I, I figured something out. I cracked the code. Conviction leads to repentance that leads to salvation. All of this is, be, is before salvation. It's to lead us to a savior. Conviction is unto salvation. Conviction isn't for the saved. Conversation is for the saved. Huh? Listen, would you rather somebody say, hey, we need to have a confrontation? Or would you some have someone say, I need to have a conversation? Right? Because the conversation's conviction. Someone says, I need to conf uh, com uh, confront you. You're ready for a fight. Yep. Someone says, hey, I need to have a conversation. It's like, oh, we're going to have some coffee. See, we have a conversation with our God, our Lord, our Savior. There is a conviction that comes pre-Christ. Conviction, repentance, salvation. It's an equation. Watch this. In Matthew 3, verse 1, John the Baptist, he comes out preaching, and he says that John the Baptist is the one preaching in the wilderness, and he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What he's saying here is the kingdom's already here. You're waiting one day for something to happen, but it's already happened. And he uses this word, repent. And that's what all next week is going to be about, okay? All next week is going to be about the word repent, but I'm going to give you a little breakdown real quick. The word repent, the English word repent, is, is translated from a word in the Greek called metanoia. Okay, metanoia. It's got two forms. It's metanoio and metanoia, right? One is the noun and one is the verb. One's the noun, one's the verb. And in fact, the word metanoia is a compound word. It's two words combined, meta, meaning with, and noias, meaning understanding, okay? And that's all that this word means. You can't make it mean something else. It means with understanding, with understanding, okay? And I mean, so we're gonna break this down so big next week, but let's just look at this real quick. Conviction with understanding leads to salvation. Conviction with confusion can never lead to salvation. This word, Metanoia, metanoio, means to exercise the mind or accompanied by the exercise of the mind. That, that there's something that has to happen inside the mind, that there has to be a mind shift, a renewing of the mind, a change in thinking to bring about a different result. Conviction with understanding leads to salvation. So we have to change our thinking, and that's what that, why that conviction comes, okay? And what's the change of thinking? You need a Savior. You can't do this on your own. You can't behave in a way that's honoring to God without the help of a comforter, counselor, advocate, and encourager. You need the Holy Spirit. The conviction of the Holy Spirit was never available to make a saved child of God feel bad about themselves. That was never the Holy Spirit. So who's doing it? Yeah, most likely you are. But if you have to blame somebody, if you have to blame somebody because you don't realize that you're beating yourself up, 
and that you're allowing your mind to run wild about decisions that you've made and you just keep thinking about them over. So let me tell you this. The other day, I got a, I got a, uh, like a panic attack, an anxiety attack of something that didn't even happen, right? I was working on a project and, and a piece of the wall that we were working on fell over. And my son had just been there like five minutes before that wall fell down. And I start thinking, oh my gosh, wonder if my son was there. Could you imagine? Like that wall would have, and I caught an anxiety attack. My chest got tight. I couldn't breathe. And I was like, that's not me. Like, I don't do this. But thinking about my son, I wrote this whole story about something that never happened. I did it to myself. I wrote a story in my mind about my kid dying and how my life would be horrible. But if you have to blame somebody, the Bible says that the devil, Satan, is the accuser of the brethren. That he is the accuser of the brethren. That if anybody is making you feel bad, which, which literally, literally, he'd have, to, he'd have to leave deceiving people all about the swine flu to come mess with you. I mean, what's the flu? Corona, yeah. <laughs> SARS? Which one are we on? He'd have to leave that to come mess with you because he's not omniscient and I'm not omnipotent. It'd be a far stretch to think that he was actually doing that. The Bible tells you to take every thought captive and make it come into subjection to the word of God. Cast down every imagination and haughty thought that tries to exalt itself against the uh, honor of God. That's our job. That's our part. And that's a real struggle. That's a real struggle. We're sitting in this cage called conviction, condemnation, when God at salvation opened the door. Yeah, but I feel so bad. Yeah, but the door is open. Yeah, but I feel so bad about what I did. Yeah, but the door is open. And he says, walk free. Walk free. Who the Son has set free is free indeed. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm in him and he is in me. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that live in me. And this life that I now live, I live in faith. I'm in him. I'm not in bondage. I'm in him. I'm not on death row. I'm not on death row. And we do this. We start feeling bad about the temptation of sin, and we lock ourselves in solitary confinement. No, I can't be around nobody. I can't be in church because, you know, I messed up. He says, yeah, but I opened this door a long time ago, bro. I opened this door years ago. Why do you keep putting yourself back in it? We got to look at the back of the book. We got to look at the last book of the uh, last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation 3 verse 19. Ready for this one? We're going to read this as God is a good God. God loves me. God is for me, not against me. Now this is going to be hard. Because this the verse the first sentence is confusing. To those whom I love, I convict. Well, God loves me, so it is him rebuking me and disciplining me. Well, let's just keep reading. To those I love, I rebuke, so be earnest and repent. Okay, hold up. We got two parts of our equation. We've got conviction. We've got repentance. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door... I'll come in, which means he's not there yet. I'll come in, which means he's not living in you yet. You're not in him, and he's not in you. Conviction, repentance, salvation. I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. This is not talking 
about the believer. This is still talking about the lost sheep that he left the 99 and go after the one. Yeah, but look, he loves all of us. John 3, 16, baby, for God so loved the world. He gave his only son that if you would believe in him, you would not perish but have everlasting life. For Jesus did not come into the world to convict the world or to condemn the world, but by him they might be saved. It was all about salvation, the conviction that leads to salvation. <laughs> conviction, repentance, salvation. This verse wasn't about those Christians who are in right standing with God. Remember this verse, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Next week, we're going to go in depth about this word, repentance. But today, I want you to see this. This love that Revelation is speaking about is not only the love for his children that accept him. Let me say it this way. This love is not confined to those who chose him, but all those that he's chosen to chase. No, no, you didn't get that. You didn't get that. This love that he says, the ones I love, I rebuke, they're not just the ones who chose him. It's the one that he chose to chase. <laughs> one of my favorite verses, stories in the Bible is the story of the prodigal son. And I'll tell you why that's my favorite story. Because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in the reality of that time frame and that time period. The story of the prodigal son is that the son goes out, spends all his inheritance, comes back. And it says that when the father saw his son afar off, the father ran. You would never catch a man of that stature in that time period running. It was dishonoring, they wouldn't do it. So right there he broke what, what would be traditional. He ran. It says that when he embraced his son, he fell on his son's neck. Would not happen in that culture in that time. The son would have to fall on his neck. He then restores him directly back to where he was before he sinned. Right back. He didn't have to start at the bottom of the ladder and work his way up. I mean, because the son said, let me just eat the pig's food. He said, what? You're my son. Kill the fatted calf. Let's throw a party. My son's return. And he gives him the staff. He puts the ring. He puts the... None of that would have actually happened if that had happened in that time period. And God is saying, I wrote the rules. I wrote the rules. I wrote the rules. How are you going to tell me how I'm going to come chase after you? We've, we've lost the specialness of what kind of God we serve because we read the Bible with incorrect lenses. We read the Bible out of self con, in self-convicting lenses. We read the Bible based upon how our day was before the day we read the Bible. And because we feel like we disappointed God, we read the scripture in the voice of a disappointed God. I'll just tell you today that if you're feeling something inside you, we have to run it by this filter. If you wanna know if it's the Holy Spirit, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. That's the only voice you can hear of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it says that the peace of God that would transcend understanding would rule you, mind and body. This is the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, 
the encourager. If the word is not encouraging, it's not the Holy Spirit. If it's not comforting, it's not the Holy Spirit. If it's not in an advocate way, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's either you or the devil. All good and perfect gifts come from above. Now, Pastor Mike, I feel like you are just watering down the gospel. You are just making this such greasy grace. Can I just say something straight out? I know I got pastors watching me online right now. You're going to get to heaven and realize that you wasted a whole lot of years having fun on earth and enjoying life and laughing because you believed in a God that wasn't mad at you. He wasn't mad at you. God the Father took out the entire penalty of sin on his son. The entire penalty. I'm telling you right now that God does everything fully and completely. He would not have wasted his son's life on a half-worked project. That's why Jesus could say, it is finished. Now, let me clarify something. Let me clarify something. For all you young adults in here, this is like, hey, 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 hey. he just said I could do whatever I want and not feel bad. Firstly, you're already doing what you want and not feeling bad. So I didn't, I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth, right? Paul said it like this, do not use this new freedom in grace, this new gospel, as a license to sin. He said, God forbid. That is not at all what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is this. Living with the lack of understanding, remember, with understanding, believing God is mad does not draw you to him and have a better relationship. It never will. Right believing will lead to right living. The joy of the Lord will be your strength, okay? When, when, when we understand that God is for us and not against us, we will bring him into the struggle. On a humanistic side, on a humanistic side, when you feel like doing something dumb, when you feel like letting stupid out the box, when you feel like going out there and doing some behavior that will violate your moral compass. I'm, a, I'm about to give you a gem. Are you ready? Yeah. Write this down. Put this in your phone. Before you let stupid out the box, before you make a decision that will then cause a scar on your heart, before you go do something you promised you would never do again, ready? Write the word down, sin, S-I-N. Write it down, S-I-N, down, down the page, S underneath the I, N. That's how we spell sin, right? Ready? This is deep. Sin means stop it now. Stop it now. Stop it right now. Before you let dumb out the box, stop it right now. Before you go do that thing that you promised God 2,700 times you wouldn't do, stop it now. Stop it right now. The Bible says this, that whenever any temptation comes, Whenever a temptation comes, God makes a way of escape so that you are not tempted beyond what you could bear. Stop it now. Stop it now. I'm going to give you another way to have a way of escape. Ready? Get a friend who's on speed dial on your cell phone. And you say, I'm about to let stupid out the box. Let's go get coffee. Get a friend, get an accountability partner, get a sponsor, get somebody in your life that you can contact in a pinch and say, I need to get out of my house. I need to get out of here. I'm at a party I don't need to be at. I'm about to do something dumb. I, come get me or let's chill, let's hang out, right? A way of escape so that you don't put yourself back in here with the heartache of a bad decision. And that's really what most of us are living with, is that we broke our own heart. 
we inflicted an emotional wound on ourselves by a bad decision. And then we're calling that God. And he's sitting there saying, hey, I'll take that broken heart and I'll mend it. I'll make all things new. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath. Everything you set your hands to will prosper and be successful. You're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the field. I will never leave you. I will be with you always, even to the very end. I love you just the way you are. This is, this is what the Holy Spirit wants to be saying to us, but we have to have those ears. Maybe you're here today and you've never found the freedom in Jesus because you haven't gone through conviction, repentance, salvation. I would say today's a day of salvation. Don't leave here today without connecting with a very real God who loves you. Not he loves you when, he loves you now. He loves you now. He loves you now. I wanna pray a prayer with you today. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we want to welcome you to the kingdom of God today. We wanna to pray this prayer with you. And we love you so much that we don't wanna leave you out there by yourself, but we wanna pray together. If you're watching online, we invite you to pray this with us. And it goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that for the very first time today, would you give me the honor of celebrating you? If you prayed that for the first time, could you just wave at me real quick and say, hey, that was me. I, pray, I see you back there, all right. Yeah, I see you over there. Anybody else real quick over here? One more time. Back there, yeah, I see you. Anybody else? Yeah, I see you in the back, yeah. All right. Welcome home. Welcome home. If you're watching online and you prayed that for the first time today, we ask you to go ahead and let us know right in that chat room that you're in right now or shoot us an email uh, on our website so that we can celebrate you too as well. We have a booklet called Starting Point uh, available at one of the high top tables in the back that will walk you through the next six days, six days of devotions in your walk with God, what you need to know about Him in the first six, six days. Uh, of your salvation. Uh, we just, we love you so much. We're, we're glad that you're here. There's a booklet on the seat back in front of you. It says, Welcome Home. Uh, that talks about Christianity, what we believe here at Family Church. That is our free gift to you. Amen? As I close out, we believe that everybody has a next step. And we have a video that we want to show with you. So, Father, we thank you for this time in your word. I bless everyone in the sound of my voice. Say they're the head and not the tail, above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Quick video. Here at Family Church, we are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. Part of that development means that we believe you'll always have a next step to take as you grow. If you recently gave your life to Christ, your next step would be starting point. This six day devotional will get you started in the Christian life and is available at any of the high top tables in the back of the room. On the third Sunday of every other month, we offer water baptism. This is how you take your faith public. Located in the chapel, we do a brief teaching on baptism, give each person an opportunity to confess their faith, and then they are baptized. Joining or leading a connect group is a great way to meet new people and connect with others who have similar hobbies and interests. You can find more information about our connect groups on our website. By taking our FAM Foundations class, you'll be able to get involved and start volunteering during our weekend services. Are you ready to be a leader? Fam Life Leadership is here to help. Whatever your next step is, we've got you covered. If you'd like more information or are ready to take your next step, visit the Next Steps table in the lobby.